Hello, friends. I was in the fifth grade. I was laying in my bunk bed. I can still remember this moment. I was disturbed. I, I couldn't shake these images from my mind. I was thinking about hell. Uh, and I can still remember the picture that was in my mind of this one glistening drop of water that was hanging from a fingertip. Just one glistening drop. And fire was burning every square inch of my body, uh, but my body wasn't burning up. It was like my body was regenerating itself and worms were eating us, but the fire wasn't burning the worms up. And so the worms would eat a hole and then that hole would close back up and they'd, they'd turn around for another pass. Uh, and everyone was gasping for that one hanging drop of water, just one drop to cool their tongue as if, as if one drop would make a difference. And, and then my brain went from there to spin into eternity, like that in hell, someone might experience this reality forever. Uh, and, and I was trying to think about that and my mind could only think so far through time. And then it was like my brain would hit this trampoline wall and I'd get sprung back to the beginning. Like I could only think so far out. And so there I lay in my bunk bed, seriously disturbed, shuddering. I can't remember who the Sunday school teacher was that uh, taught this lesson, but the lesson, the parable that we had been looking at was the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And all, all I had taken from that parable was that image of this one glistening drop of water that I wasn't allowed to have for all of eternity. Now, I'll add, I'll add a layer. That layer is, I know I'm not alone in how disturbed I felt. Uh, I've had conversations with too many people who have had a loved one die, and they really didn't know if their loved one had faith in Jesus uh, or not. And so... They have similar pictures going on in their mind of hell. And then they have this loved one. They don't really know where they're at. And, and then those pictures start to mix for them. And, and then they just can't handle it. Like it's seriously traumatizing to them. Now is that dark enough for you? Before you start feeling as dark and traumatized and disturbed as I did, uh, let me quickly clear a few things up. So, yes, we are looking at the parable of Lazarus and the rich man today. And yes, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man does depict the rich man thirsting for a single drop of water. But the rich man is not in hell. He's not in Gehenna. That's where we twist things up. The rich man is in Hades, and there is a difference. We will get to that. So let me say that again. The That picture that I had in my mind laying in my bunk bed, the, the one drop picture, it's not a picture of hell. If we're going to take that little bit of data from this parable and try to plug it into our picture of hell, we're, we're mixing things up. Now, briefly on hell. Before we get into our parable about Hades, uh, briefly on hell. There are four his historic views of hell that Christians have held. And... So there were church leaders arguing all throughout 
uh, church history for one of the four views. Um, like different people held different views and they all claim my view can be based and backed up in scripture. Uh, so they all think their view is the right one. Uh, the four views are eternal conscious torment. That's that's the picture that I had kind of <laughs> that one drop thing. Uh, conditionalism, which is basically if you ultimately don't want God, then God will remove God's hand from you and you will cease to exist. Uh, purgatory, which says, yes, there are second, third, fourth, fifth chances to turn to Jesus and to be made holy. Um, Christian universalism, which says that in the Bible, all means all. So all will be reconciled to Christ. Christ draws all people to himself. Christ made all alive. All knees will bow and all tongues confess that Christ is Lord. It, it doesn't say all roads lead to God. Uh, rather, it asks, is there anyone who can resist the love of God forever? Uh, what human can do that? Now, <clears throat> When you start looking at church history, the church fathers and mothers, uh, leaders of ch churches, church history, uh, they disagreed on most things about hell, uh, including the four views. Uh, each one of those four views can say, well, these people back in church history, they, they held this view. Uh, in fact, if you're looking for, well, what did everyone kind of have a consensus on? Uh, the thing that they have consensus on is that the that imagery of fire and worms in scripture is not to be taken literally. That's where they have consensus. Uh, that's Ambrose. That's John of Damascus, Augustine, Arrhenius, Clement of Alexandria, Chrysostom, Council of Lyons II, uh, Lactantius, on and on. Uh, Thomas Oden gives a very good summary of this, summarizes this ancient Christian view and says, hell is for those who think they are too good to be helped by God. Uh, so hell is to be forever without God and against God. So whichever view of hell you take, if you decide that you're, you are certain that your perspective is right and you say, I'm going to hold this with certainty rather than saying I I'm speculating this might be the way it is it, so if you're certain and you're going to throw your dart you you have a one in four chance of being right at best pew maybe you got it well whew, I I wish that someone would have told me that when I was in the fifth grade they didn't so it brings us <clears throat> to our parable of Lazarus and the rich man. So Luke 16, verse 19 is where we're picking up today. This story, it was not a new story to Jesus' audience. Uh, people were familiar with this story Jesus told. There were numerous rabbinic versions of this parable. Uh, there were similar folk tales of this parable actually in other cultures. Um, Egyptians, Greeks, Plato, Plutarch had stories that had similarities. So Jesus is working with material that everyone's familiar with, but his story holds a different message. So here it is. There was a rich man who habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. He lived in joyous splendor and luxury every day. This tycoon was loaded. He could afford to dress as only kings dress. Here was a man who everyone knew. 
highly visible in the community, a local celebrity, his fashion was impeccable. Everyone was paying attention to what he's wearing. And every time you walk by his house, the smell of food that his chefs were preparing, it transported you for a moment to paradise. Oh man, that smells so good. He's constantly hosting parties for the mucky mucks, dancing and wine and lavish food. And rich men like this, they didn't even use napkins to, to wipe their hands. But rather, the rich man would provide bread, bread for the people to use as napkins. And they'd, they'd wipe their hands and then they'd just toss the crust on the toss the bread on the floor for the servants to clean up later. This was extravagance in a world of limited goods where many people didn't even have bread. Now, outside of the rich man's home, there was a gate and there were walls keeping the rest of the world at bay. And at that gate, there lay a poor man named Lazarus. He could no longer walk. He couldn't get around. He was sick. He was covered with sores. He was an outcast of society. Here was a, an invisible person in his world. Uh, every rich person on their way to the rich man's parties had to walk by Lazarus. They had to look the other way, close their eyes. They had to hug their nose to his smell, uh, not pay attention as he would ask, please, please, a hunk of bread, please, I'm starving to death. They had to step over him, laying against the wall, ignored, invisible, exploited, forgotten, starving, suffering, dying. Everyone knew the, the thought of the day. The Pharisees said it. Everyone knew it. It's that guy laying there against that wall. Uh, he's obviously being punished by God for something. And of course, the, the wealth, the health of this rich man, it's because God likes him. God's happy with him. So every day, the rich man's servants would come into the banquet hall and they would they'd sweep up the napkins and the these breadcrumbs left behind, and they'd throw them into the garbage along with the rest of the rubbish. And the servants would take the garbage, they'd walk out into the street and throw it out into the street where the stray dogs would fight over the scraps. There's no such thing as a pet dog. Dogs were unclean, filthy, vermin. And every day, Lazarus, along with the dogs, would scramble and try to collect enough bread crumbs to survive when it was thrown out, when the garbage was thrown out, before the dogs could just grab it all and wolf down the garbage. But Lazarus wasn't making it. He was slowly starving to death. With the smell of roasting meat and baking bread in his nostrils and begging for bread, please, please, separated by this gate, these walls, this, this great chasm that made him invisible in his world with only dogs for companions. The day came when Lazarus breathed his last. There was no one to collect his body, no one to give it a proper burial. What does a stray pack of dogs do to a dead body? Don't know if I want to know. How long did his dead body just lie there before the angels carried him away to Abraham's bosom? Lazarus, the, the invisible man, was now snuggled in, comforted, honored by the most well-known 
of all Israelites. Yeah, that's right. We we just shifted to like a an after death picture. The the father of every Israelite, Abraham, uh, and and there Lazarus is in Abraham's arms, receiving all of the love, all of the care, all of the tenderness and affection that he never knew in this life. Now, for anyone who's taking the story too literally, there are big questions to ask and answer. Like, well, wait a minute, how how big is Lazarus's bosom that we get that term? Like, and is that the right word? Do men have bosoms? Uh, some translations say his side. Uh, like, can can Abraham handle the the millions and billions of people being carried away by angels, and they're all being brought to snuggle him into Abraham's bosom, or does Abraham get tired of this and tell the angels, like, guys, can you can you just hold off for a bit? Uh, I, carrying everyone to my bosom, like, I I just need a break. So you can see we can we can be too literal with this parable. Uh, we can take the parable too far. So moving on. The rich man, he also passed away. And of course, everyone knew about it. Everyone in the community, there was a big funeral. Everyone came and there was an honorable burial. And the rich man found himself not in Lazarus or, or Abraham's arms, but in Hades. Now, here's where we have to pause and uh, talk for a moment about Hades. Hades is not hell. Get, uh, there, there are two different words. Uh, Gehenna is hell or Hades. Now, Hades is made up of two words. And it literally means that which is not seen. The invisible one. It means to not see, not perceive, not pay attention not talk with, not know, not cherish. In the, the earliest days of Jewish thought and in the Old Testament, Hades was understood to be the place of the dead, both the, the righteous and the unrighteous. Everyone uh, went to Hades. Uh, it was, the, the Hebrew word was Sheol. Um, it's the grave. It's the nether regions, the underworld. It was nothingness. The, the land of deepest night, shadow, gloom, like you die and things go kind of dark. Um, now, as time went on, there were these Greek ideas of the afterlife with rewards and punishment that started to get kind of plugged in and attached to this idea of Hades, Sheol. And, and so views of the afterlife were very much in flux at the time when Jesus is telling this story. And Hades is viewed as this, this waiting place. It's an intermediate state before the final judgment. And there were plenty of rabbinic stories and folk stories floating around that kind of had this idea that, you know, the, the wicked might as well start being punished already. Like, let's not wait around. Let's just put them into torment now. Start the, the punishment early. And so uh, these stories were told where the wicked are punished and the righteous are comforted in Hades. And that was the way the stories went. It was this story of kind of like the great reversal, the turning of the tables. Now, whatever Hades is in scripture, we know it's temporary because the book of Revelation, Jesus ultimately cast Hades into the lake of fire. Like it's, it is, doesn't last forever. Revelation 20. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. In this particular story, uh, when the rich man is said to be in Hades, Hades is described as a touchstone. Uh, it's, it's the word in your Bible, it may say he's in torment. Uh, it's the word Basanas, 
and it would be a touchstone. You say, what's that? Well, it's a test that's designed to produce a confession. Uh, so as, as it goes, let's say you've got a rock and you're thinking, is this gold uh, or is it, is it genuine or is it not? Well, you take a touchstone, which is a hard black stone that's going to leave a streak on the stone surface, and you give it pressure. You, you, you do a test because you want to know, is this thing genuine or not? What's the quality here? So this story is showing Hades as a touchstone. I think you'll start to see that come through. So back to our story. In Hades, this rich man was experiencing the touchstone, and it felt like torment to him. And he looked up, and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus in his bosom. And he calls out, the rich man calls out to Abraham. He says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in emotional distress and mental pain in this fire. Catch what just happened there? So the rich man, he recognizes Abraham as his father, right? Which means like the father of every Israelite, which would make Abraham the father of Lazarus, which would make Lazarus his brother, his family, but he's not picking up on that. He's not picking up on that at all. The rich man knows the name of that guy over there who starved to death outside of his gates of his home. That guy who was begging for food, he that guy he ignored, he knows his name. The rich man just admitted that walking by this starving guy and knowing something about him wasn't an accident because he knows who he is. Send Lazarus. He knows his name. And just like Lazarus longed for a crumb of bread from the rich man, now the rich man is longing for a drop of water, just one drop of water from Lazarus. That's the great reversal. Uh, it's the part of the story that everyone is expecting. Uh, it's the part that everyone loves. They're like, justice. Uh, but we have to keep looking. H how is the rich man relating to Lazarus, this invisible man? Notice the rich man refuses to speak directly to Lazarus. He doesn't say, uh, hey, Lazarus, I know I ignored you day after day. Uh, I know you starved to death and rotted outside of my home. You must be completely just completely, incredibly angry with me. And now I see how wrong I was. And I know you're my brother. I'm really sorry. Will you please forgive me? I'm suffering here. Could you please come give me some kind of relief? He doesn't say anything like that. Nothing close to it. Because to him, Lazarus is inferior. Lazarus is way, way below him. To even speak to him, he's not going to do that. And so he's treating Lazarus like he's his slave or Abraham's slave, some guy who can be ordered around. And so he's telling Abraham, like, tell him to go dip his finger in the water and bring me a drop. It's also important to notice that this agony that the rich man is in, it is emotional. It's mental agony. It's uh, the true suffering is not the fire. It's whatever's going on here and here. Uh, the word is uh, adunao. Uh, so I imagine Abraham like seeing this interchange and he, he's got Lazarus right there with him. And he's like, I, I don't think he's seeing you. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he's catching on to what's going on here. You remember, Hades is to not see. It's to not perceive. 
to not talk with, to not cherish, that is Hades. And that's what's happening here. So Abraham responds to the rich man. He says, my child, family, right? My child, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, while Lazarus received injury and destruction. He's like trying to get some empathy here for this guy's situation. But now he's being comforted here, and you are in emotional and mental distress. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm that's fixed. Those who want to go from here to you cannot. And nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So the rich man's walls had always kept people like Lazarus out. And now there's this chasm that still stands between the rich man and people like Lazarus. So the rich man responds, Well, I beg you, Father, send, send Lazarus to my family. I, I have five brothers. So let him warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment, this touchstone. Now, this is where Jesus deviates from all the folk stories, all the other stories that people know, by bringing in the five living brothers. Uh, I can see Abraham turning to Lazarus again, and he's like, uh, he, he still isn't seeing you. He still isn't getting it. The, the rich man simply pivoted to a new errand to send this slave Lazarus on. Uh, and he's asking for special treatment, privilege treatment for his brothers. Hey, Abraham, uh, so just can you send my brothers a vision so they don't end up here? Send this guy, uh, what's his name? Send Lazarus. Uh, have him tell them. He, he isn't seeing who Lazarus is, his brother. It, the rich man's definition of family has not expanded at all. He thinks he only has five brothers. Uh, he, you know, he's looking back and he's like, I've got these five brothers. He's not seeing who his other brother is. He's not paying attention. He's not talking with. He's not cherishing his brother Lazarus. Lazarus to him is a nobody, a slave, an expendable. And it is literal Hades. The touchstone really is not revealing the quality of gold in a good way. What, what's being revealed in the rich man is not pretty. The rich man is in mental and emotional agony because he still does not see and cherish, love his brother, Lazarus. And so Abraham replies. He says, they have Moses. They have the prophets. Let your brothers listen to them. And now the rich man, he's indignant. He's demanding, no, Father Abraham. He says, if, if, someone, if someone will go from the dead, then they'll repent. Like, what if we, what if we send this guy, what, whatever his name is, uh, this Lazarus guy, like as a vision, then, then if we, no, wait, no, don't send him as a vision. Send him in person. Like, as a resurrection, if you do that, then it'll work out. Well, the rich man's still blind. He, he doesn't see that this source of agony, mental and emotional agony and anguish, his, his torment, he doesn't see what's going on inside of him. Lazarus to him is a means to an end. He's a pawn. He doesn't see that the person that he's calling someone has a name. Lazarus, and that someone starved to death outside of his home while he was using bread as napkins. And that someone is his brother who he should be talking to and who he should be reconciling with. And he still wants that someone to go run slave errands for him and give his brother special treatment without any thought for that someone's needs or comfort. Like, just resurrect him and send him back. Like, well, what's going to happen to him if you do that? 
he's, he's going to starve and die all over again after he delivers the message. Hades. So Abraham says to the rich man, if they don't listen to Moses, if they don't listen to the prophets, they are not going to be convinced, even if you send someone, even if someone rises from the dead. Moses, Isaiah, Zechariah, Jeremiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Micah, Malachi, Ezekiel, all of them say, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow, show mercy and compassion, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of the destitute, defend the rights of the poor and the needy, do no wrong to the foreigner, loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed free, break every yoke, share your food with the hungry, provide the foreigner and the poor wanderer with shelter, clothe the naked, do not turn away from your own flesh and blood, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if the rich man's brothers won't listen to this, are they really going to listen to Lazarus if he hobbles and drags himself into their homes and asks for a hearing, mumbling something about how their dead brother sent him? Or will they quickly call their guards and their servants and throw this crazy man out of here, this crazy vermin, throw him out in the streets, starve to death? You, you won't believe what happened today. Some homeless guy came like hobbling into my house and he's mumbling something about how he thought he would come back from the dead. What a nut. I don't know what they're smoking these days. And that's the parable. Now, this certainly isn't Jesus' last word on Hades. Maybe Abraham can't cross the chasm. Maybe the rich man can't cross the chasm. But Jesus can. After his death, after his resurrection, Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead and look, I, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So for everyone who wonders, because there are a lot of people who wonder, are, is there such a thing as a second chance, like a second opportunity to turn to Jesus after death? Well, the best news I can find in scripture is Jesus' descent into Hades after his death, where he proclaims the good news to everyone. So, 1 Peter 3. Christ was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. That's all the world was filled with violence. Ephesians 4, when Jesus ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to humans. In saying he ascended, that's he went up. What does it mean but that he also descended into Hades? The, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. That's 1 Peter 4. That is, there were a whole lot of people who were in Hades. Jesus crosses the chasm and he brings back a lot of folks with him. He breaks down the gates of Hades. He crosses the chasm. He releases the dead captives who are unable to see, unable to love, unable to cherish, and leads those captives out and ultimately destroys Hades. Now, Jesus doesn't tell this parable here just to get us to ask, like, 
well, wait a minute, how many, how many chances will the rich man be given? Or how big is Abraham's bosom? Or how many people can he comfort? Or is everyone in Hades just asking for one drop of water? That's not why Jesus is telling this parable. And if we make this parable about Hades or about hell, we're kind of missing the point. Because Jesus is telling this parable to try to get me and you, you and me, to ask who is the Lazarus at our gates? That's the question. So who are the people who we shut our eyes to? And we cover our ears. We plug our nose. We walk by, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, the people who have no bread, no means, no help, no doctor, no home, no friends, no family. While we decide which drink will I have with supper tonight? And which shirt should I wear today? And which car am I going to drive today? And which room should I hang out in? And which doctor am I going to see? And which friend am I going to hang out with? Which relative will I visit? Who is it that I'm not seeing? Not talking, not cherishing, Who's invisible to me. Jesus says, in as much as you have done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. Hope you'll think, reflect,